بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يده الله فلا مضل له ومن يذلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هج محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشار الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار the next matter that is mentioned the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم stated واذا استنصحك فانصحه and when he seeks your advice then advise him when he seeks your advice then advise him This here barakallahu fikum establishes that from the rights that we as Muslims have over one another is the seeking and the giving of advice we have in the narration of Jarir ibn Abdullah رضي الله عنه he said بايعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم على إقامة الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة والنصح لكل مسلم جرير بن عبد الله he mentioned that i gave the pledge of allegiance to the messenger of allah for the establishment of the prayer and the giving of the zakat and being or having the nus or advising or being sincere with every muslim advising one's brother or sister in al islam this is from the affairs of the deen as we have in the narration in the sahih of imam muslim on the authority of Tamim al-Dari Abu Ruqayya radiyallahu an now he stated or he stated the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said ad-din an-nasiha qalu liman ya rasulullah qala lillah wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi ولي ائمه المسلمين وعامتهم the 
Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned that the deen is an nasiha. And the companions they said, "For who a messenger of Allah?" And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned that the nasiha it is for Allah. It is for his book. It is for his messenger. It is for the leaders from amongst the Muslims and their common folk. The shahid here is it is for their common. The nasiha for the Muslim is that we want good for them. And we advise them with that which is good. And direct them to that which we know of to be a benefit for them in this life as well as in the hereafter. This is from the methodology of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Whatever good that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew for this Ummah, he advised us with it. And whatever evil that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew for this Ummah, he warned us against it and prohibited us from it. This is from Iman. As the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه. That none of you truly believes until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. The ulama mention that if your brother or sister seeks your advice. Regarding a matter in the affairs of this world, whether it be marriage or buying and selling, then it is upon you to advise the individual of that which you know of good, and it is not upon you to conceal that which you know in relation to that which you have been asked about. Nor is it for you to sugarcoat the affairs because that can lead to a person being misled in his decision. It is upon the individual to advise with the truth And don't conceal the truth or sugarcoat the truth. And do not deceive your brother or sister in Islam. And warn your brother or sister in Islam from that which you know of harmful matters. Because if you are asked for advice and you have knowledge of that affair which you are being asked about, and you conceal that knowledge, and you don't inform your brother or sister with that which will be a benefit of them in the life of this world and hereafter, and then as a result of your concealing of the knowledge, they fall into some harm. This is considered khiyana. This is considered deception and betrayal of a trust. In the khiyana of the amana, this is from the sifat al-munafiqeen, betraying the trust that we have amongst one another as brothers and sisters. This is from the characteristics of the hypocrites. If advice is sought, and the person doesn't have knowledge of the affair, then it is upon the person to practice another aspect of Iman in this case, 
And that is, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawm al-akhir fal yaqul khayran aw li yasmud. That whoever believes in Allah in the last day, then let them speak that which is good or remain silent. Some people, Allah Musta'an, when they are asked for advice, although they do not have knowledge of that affair, they still open their mouths and speak about that which they have no knowledge of. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions لا تقفو ما ليس لك بالعلم Do not speak about that which you have no knowledge of. So if advice is sought from the individual then it is obligatory to give the advice. But if the advice is not sought, then it is recommended to give advice. Except that we see that the Muslim is involved in something that is detrimental. We have to advise the person, even if the individual did not seek the advice. We look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When the man came to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, O Sini, Qala la taqdab. The man came to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, O Messenger of Allah, advise me. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Do not become angry. And he repeated this statement. During the farewell speech of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the narration of Al-Irbad ibn Sariya and he said, O Messenger of Allah, it is as if this is a farewell speech that you're given. What do you advise us with? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, O Seekum bi taqwa Allah وَالسَّمْعِ وَالطَّعَةِ وَإِنْ تَأَمْرَ عَلَيْكُمْ عَبْدٌ حَبَشِيٌّ He said, I advise you with the taqwa of Allah and I advise you to hear and obey the Muslim ruler even if an Abyssinian slave becomes your leader. to the end of the narration. And being that we're speaking about advice, we advise the people who come into this room. If you are brothers hiding behind screen names of women, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And do not harass the women who have come here to learn about their religion, to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These sisters in this room, they are wives of men, and daughters of men, and sisters of men, and mothers of men. And you, as a male, wouldn't want no one to harass your wife, or your mother, or your sister, or your daughter. So don't harass the wives of others, mothers of others, and the sisters of others, and the daughters of others. And even if a sister who is in this room is none of the above, she is still a Muslimah who is honored to be preserved. So be mindful and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you are a disbeliever who is hiding behind the name and coming here to distract the people, don't waste your time. Why don't you learn something that is beneficial for you? Maybe you can save yourself from the hellfire. Because if you are a disbeliever who is not within the fold of Islam and you die in that state, then know for a fact that your destination will be the hellfire 
forever to abide therein, and you will never come out. The next matter that has been mentioned by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from the right that the Muslims have over one another and if the person sneezes and he praises Allah then make the tashmid for him meaning say yarhamukullah that is the meaning of a tashmid but if a person sneezes and he says alhamdulillah you say yarhamukullah The statement, Alhamdulillah, to Allah. And the statement, Yarhamukullah, this means, may Allah have mercy upon you. The matter of sneezing, is a ni'mah, it is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because sneezing is a means of purifying the body from bacteria and other harmful particles. So the person's sneezing repels these affairs from the nose. And then it is mentioned that as a result of the sneezing, these particles of bacteria which has entered, they come out of the individual and the person becomes free from them. This is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And due to this ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a person should praise Allah after sneezing. Being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sneezing a means of protecting the body from bacteria and unwanted particles. In this barakallahu fikum, we have the clear indication that Islam is a complete way of life. Islam is a complete way of life you will not find any from amongst the different religions in this world addressing every aspect of one's human life as well as one's life in the hereafter like Islam addresses the affairs. So the matter of sneezing, when a person sneezes and he says, Alhamdulillah, after he sneezes, it is upon the one who has heard the individual say, Alhamdulillah, to respond by saying, Yarhamukullah. In this statement, Yarhamukullah the one who has heard the one sneezing praising Allah 
is asking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestow his mercy upon the individual due to the individual praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is a principle in Islam that is known as al jazau min jins al-amal. That the reward that a person receives is based upon the good that they do. So due to the person saying alhamdulillah, which is good, the one who hears the individual say alhamdulillah is commanded to say ya rahmatullah as a reward for that person praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the one who sneezes and they heard the person say for them ya rahmatullah after they have said alhamdulillah they say in return yahdikumullah wa yuslih balakum that may Allah guide you and straighten out your affairs. Again, establishing the principle al jaza min jins al amal. The scholars they differ. When an individual says Alhamdulillah after sneezing, is it obligatory upon everyone who has heard the person sneeze? Is it obligatory upon them to say Ya Rahmukullah? Some of the scholars they mention. That the statement, Ya Rahmukullah, is Fardun Kifaya, is a communal. That if someone in the group responds with Ya Rahmukullah, then the obligation is removed from the others. Others from the ulama, they state that rather the statement, Ya Rahmukullah, is an individual obligation upon everyone who has heard the one who sneezed say alhamdulillah because the prophet sallallahu mentioned that this is from the rights of the muslim upon the muslim Shaykh Uthaymeen, he mentions, Rahimahullah, وَالظَّاهِرْ هَذَا أَنَّهُ فَرْضُ عَيْنٍ فَعَلَى هَذَا كُلُّ مَنْ سَمِعَهُ يَقُولُ لَهُ يَرْحَمُكُ اللَّهِ Shaykh Uthaymeen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he mentions, was apparent that this is an individual obligation. So it is upon everyone who has heard the one who sneezed say Alhamdulillah that that person says Ya Rahmatullah. And then the person he says and responds Ya Hadikumullah wa Yuslih Dalakum. In this statement, يَهْدِكُمْ اللَّهُ وَيُسْلِحْ بَالَكُمْ He only has to say it once. He doesn't have to say it to every individual who said, Ya Allah. So as an example, we are sitting in one of the gatherings of the ulama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to sit in the gatherings of the scholars and to benefit from their knowledge and from their manners. I mean, if the shaykh, he sneezes and says, Alhamdulillah. And we say, Ya Rahmukullah, and there's hundreds of students there. The shaykh doesn't have to say, Ya Hadikum Allah, we yuslih balakum. Ya Hadikum Allah, we yuslih balakum. Ya Hadikum Allah, we yuslih balakum. No. 
just saying, Ya Hadikumullah, Wuslih Balakum once suffices for everyone who said, Ya Rahmukullah. If the person sneezes and he doesn't say Alhamdulillah, then we do not say to this person, Ya Rahmukullah. Because the statement, Ya Rahmukullah, is contingent upon the person saying Alhamdulillah. If the person doesn't say Alhamdulillah, we don't say to the person Ya Rahmukullah. As a means of disciplining the person for not praising Allah for the ni'mah of sneezing. So, being that you didn't praise Allah, you will be prevented from our dua. So we do not say to the person, Ya Rahmukullah. Then the question comes, is the individual to be reminded? Do we say to the person, say Alhamdulillah, or not? Is the individual to be reminded? Do we say to him, say Alhamdulillah, you just sneezed, or not? It is stated that it's possible that the person who did not say Alhamdulillah, he did this out of negligence. Or it's possible that the person who did not say Alhamdulillah, he did this out of forgetfulness. If the person did it or left off, I should say, the statement Alhamdulillah out of forgetfulness, the person is to be reminded. As Allah mentions, with that year, for in the dhikr of tan fa'ul mu'mini, and remind for verily the reminder benefits the believer. Some of the ulama stated that it is disliked to remind the person to say Alhamdulillah. Or they say that if the person has left off saying Alhamdulillah out of negligence, he is not to be reminded. But the question comes, how does a person know whether the person... He has left off saying Alhamdulillah out of forgiveness or out of negligence. The apparent wording of the hadith states that if the person does not say Alhamdulillah, that you do not say Alhamdulillah, nor do you remind the person to say Alhamdulillah. Shaykh al Taymin, he mentioned, Rahimahullah, he said, Walakin yumkinuka fi ma ba'd an tu'allimahu wa taqoolahu inna al insan idha atasa fa inna hu yahmad Allah ala had al itas. Yan al itas min Allah. He said, however, it is possible for you to teach the individual afterwards and say that when a person sneezes, that the person should praise Allah for sneezing, because sneezing is from Allah. And then he should mention that yawning is from the shaitan. And as a side point, we find that people, when they yawn, they start to say some words, seeking refuge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is upon them to have a proof 
for saying a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem or the likes of it when they yawn. Like we have a proof of saying alhamdulillah when we sneeze. Rather that which we find from the sunnah is placing one's hand over the mouth or covering the mouth when one yawns. Another point in relation to saying Ya Rahmatullah is that this is done three times. Meaning if a person sneezes three times and says Alhamdulillah each time, then we say to the person Ya Rahmatullah three times. As for when the person sneezes the fourth time, then we say to the person, Arthaq Allah, and may Allah cure you and make you better, for indeed you are experiencing some sickness. So you clarify to the individual that that which he is experiencing is from sickness, and you make dua for the person that Allah cures the person. As is mentioned by the ulama, sometimes a person sneezes due to being sick and not due to the body repelling any type of harmful bacteria or particles. Or as some ulama mentioned that the affair of sneezing is an indication of the body being energetic. Scholars mentioned know that the sneezing at times can be from a person being sick. And the person should be mindful to keep away from anything that will increase in the person's sickness or having a cold. As is mentioned by many of the doctors of medicine, that there is really no cure for the common cold. And that the cold leaves when it has come to an end. But there are matters that a person can keep away from to try to lessen the effects of the cold from it keeping away from cold air and not drinking anything that is cold and not placing oneself in coldness after being in a place that is warm. These are advices that have come from the ulama of al sunnah wal jamaah for those individuals who try to say that our scholars, they are not aware of anything except for the, the rules and regulations of menstruation and divorce and khula and other than that. SubhanAllah wa bihamd. It is mentioned that the Jews used to sneeze in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is stated that they used to sneeze purposely in the presence of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in order for him to say to them, Ya Allah. Why? Because they knew that he was the prophet from Allah and that his dua that Allah has mercy upon them would be a benefit for them. They knew this. However, it would not have benefited them due to them being disbelievers. And another 
point, another point that has been mentioned by the ulama that it's not permissible for us that when they die that we ask Allah to have mercy upon them and to forgive them. As Allah mentions, ما كان للنبي والذين آمنوا أن يستغفروا للمشركين ولو كانوا أولي القربى من بعد ما تبين لهم أنهم أصحاب الجحيم سورة التوبة verse 113 that it is not for the believers to seek forgiveness for the polyth is not for the prophet and the believers or those who believe to seek forgiveness for the polytheists even if they are the closest of relatives after it has become clear to them that they are from the companions of the hellfire rather that which is found in some narrations that if a kappa sneezes, then we can say to them, Yahdikumullah. That we can say to them, May Allah guide you. Meaning, may Allah guide you to Islam. So now our question is, well, how can we say this to a Muslim? And when at the same time, this is something that we will say to the disbelievers. The answer is when we pray or make dua that Allah guides the Muslim, then what is intended keeps them upon the guidance. As our brother Hafizullah Ta'ala Abu Anisa mentioned from the benefits of Surah Al-Fatiha, the Hidayah of Al-Thabat, the guidance of being established upon the guidance. That's the form of guidance, the category of guidance. So in relation to the Muslim, when we say, Yahdikum Allah wa islih balakum, that may Allah guide you and rectify your affairs, What's intended is may Allah keep you upon guidance and bring about good in your affairs. As for when speaking in relation to a kafir, then may Allah guide them or rectify their affairs, meaning may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them to Islam and rectify their affairs, meaning changing their affairs from kufr to iman and from shirk to the tawheed. The next matter that has been mentioned وَإِذَا مَرَيْضَ فُعُدُ And when he becomes sick, visit him. From the rights of the Muslims upon the Muslims, is visiting the one who is sick. Most cases when a person becomes sick, the individual remains in his or her home due to the weakness of one's body because of the sickness. So the individuals, brothers or sisters in Al-Islam, they visit. And they remind the individual of that which is befitting to remind the individual of. Reminding the person with tawbah. Reminding the person with the remembrance of Allah and with seeking Allah's forgiveness. And other than that from the righteous actions. Also making dua for the person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clears, uh, clears them of the sickness or cures them from the sickness. Like saying that, that's tuhurun insha'Allah. May no harm come to you and may this be a means of purification insha'Allah. 
Some of the scholars, they mention that the visiting of the sick is an obligation upon the Muslim. And it is stated that rather it is an obligation, but it is a communal obligation. This follows on Kifayat. That someone from amongst the community carries out this obligation, then the obligation is removed from others who have the ability to carry out. Now, others from amongst the scholars, they state that the visiting of the sick is a recommended matter. And some have mentioned that there is a consensus of the scholars that visiting the sick is not obligatory. But this is not the case. As we, it is clear that there are ulama who say that the visiting of the sick is an obligation. Or it can be stated that what is meant by there is an ijma that the visiting of the sick is not obligatory, meaning obligatory upon every individual. But as stated, there are some scholars who even say that. The visiting of the sick can be visiting those who you know and those who you don't know. Those who are relatives and those who are not relatives. It is mentioned in relation to visiting of the sick that there are some mannerisms that are to be observed when you are visiting the sick. From the mannerisms is that a person should not constantly visit the sick because this can lead to inconvenience in the person who is sick. And the person should not be one who's constantly questioning the individual about his or her state. Unless that we know that the person he is happy with that. Also, it is not befitting for anyone to be excessive in his or her speech with the individual who may have a sickness that the person becomes tired quickly in having excessive speech, again, will lead to the inconvenience and make the person who is sick uncomfortable. And when you do visit the sick, you don't stay there for a long time. Because the person may have a need to fulfill with his family or himself. However, if you know that the person who is sick loves that you stay with him for a long time, then this is something different. But in most cases, when a person is sick, they need their rest. And when a person visits the sick, they should visit during suitable hours. And they should not visit during the times when people normally sleep or when the person is taking the qaylula, the siesta or the nap. Also, one thing that is befitting is that if you know of a treatment, a medical treatment, or a cure for the person's ailment, then it is upon you to remind the individual of that medicine and that treatment. Because taking medicine and receiving treatment for one's ailment, this is something that is permissible. Rather, it is tada'u bi haram. That seek treatment or treat yourselves but do not treat yourselves with that which is haram. And taking medicine does not go against the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
rather the taking of the medicine is from the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is the one who has placed the cure in the medicines. Also, it is mentioned it is befitting to ask the individual, how does he pray? Because many from amongst those who are sick, they are not aware of the rules and the regulations of the sick person and how they pray. And do they still use water for purification or make tayammum? And other than that. So if you are a person who is aware of the rules and the regulations of praying and purification for the sick, you inform the person in order to bring ease to their hearts. Also, sometimes a person may be under a misconception that being that it is okay for the sick person to combine between their salats, they may think that it's permissible for them to shorten the prayer, but this is not the case if the person is a resident. Another matter, if the person is sick with a sickness that we see the signs of death coming upon the individual, then in this case, we make the talqeen. As the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, لَقِّنُوا مَوْتَاكُمْ بِلَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ The Prophet Sallallahu he mentioned, cause those from amongst you who was about to die to say, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَى اللَّهِ and the ulama, they have mentioned that the mannerisms of doing this is that we say by their side, la ilaha illallah, la ilaha, like that in, the, in, in a low tone. And then when the person hears this statement, that they will say, la ilaha illallah, repeating after us. And once the individual has said, La ilaha illallah, leave the person. As has been mentioned by the ulama, don't start talking about another affair now which will cause the person to now have another statement after the statement of La ilaha illallah. And when the person is in a state where he or she is about to die, it is not legislated to recite Surah to Yasin or any other Surah. Rather, that which mentions that recite Surah to Yasin upon your death, this narration is not authentic. The narration is a weak narration, and we are not to work by that which is weak. Another point in relation to visiting the sick, the scholars have mentioned the permissibility of visiting the disbelievers who are sick when there is a religious benefit in doing so. For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he visited a young Jewish boy who used to work for him. And when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam entered upon him, he said to him, Qul. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. The Prophet sallallahu said to him, Say, I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except for Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So the boy, he looked at his father. And his father said, 
Abel Qasim. He said, Obey Abel Qasim. So the boy said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. And then he died. Then the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Alhamdulillah, alladhi anqadahu bi min al nar Oh, praise due to Allah, the one who has saved him by way of me from the hellfire. And likewise, the Prophet ﷺ visited his uncle Abu Talib when he was upon his deathbed. And he said to him, Ya Ammi, Oh my uncle, say la ilaha illallah. A statement that I can argue with on your behalf with Allah. However, the uncle of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Talib, he was being encouraged. To remain upon the path of Abdul Muttalib. He was being encouraged not to say La ilaha illallah and leave off the ways of a shirk. And this encouragement. It came from Abu Jahl and Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah. Abu Jahl, he was killed in Badr. And as for Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, he accepted Islam at a lot of time. But the scholars, they mentioned from this of how evil companionship can have a negative effect upon you. And I say this to say that we should not allow the people of sin and transgression who will come and be a negative influence upon our sick to visit them. Rather, the people of righteousness we allow to visit our sick so that they can be a means of encouragement to do good. But as for the people who want to come and visit the sick and indulge in nothing but sin and transgression, the person is sick, especially the person who's on his deathbed. This individual is on his way to meet his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you have individuals visiting, coming with matters of sin and transgression. These people are to be kept away from the sick. So these two narrations is that which is used to establish the permissibility of visiting the disbelievers for a religious benefit. The question comes, what about the people of innovation? Are we to visit the people of innovation when they become sick? In relation to visiting the people of innovation, if their innovation has taken them outside of the fold of Islam, then they are not to be visited unless there is going to be some religious benefit in it. Like meaning the person being reminded to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to come back into the fold of Islam. Because the people of innovation who have left the fold of Islam, they are kufar. There is a narration that mentions إِنَّ مَجُوسْ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ الْمُكَذِّبُونَ بِأَكْذَارِ اللَّهِ إِنْ مَرِضُوا فَلَا تُعُودُوهُمْ وَإِنْ مَاتُوا فَلَا تَشْهَدُوهُمْ 
او كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet he mentioned صلى الله عليه وسلم and his narration has been declared to be a good narration by الإمام الشيخ على الباني رحمه الله The Prophet mentioned that the Magians indeed the Magians of this nation are the ones who deny the decree of Allah If they become sick don't visit them and if they die then do not witness their funeral procession so the matter or the question is how do we combine between the texts the scholars have mentioned that if it is not hope that there will be a benefit in visiting them meaning them coming back to Islam then do not visit them do not visit them as for the deviant who has not left the fold of Islam the person is still a Muslim and the individual still has the rights the general rights of the Muslim and some of the Mashaykh mentioned that this is in the case when the person is not one who outwardly displays his innovation I mean, he's not a caller to innovation. In the scholars of the past, they have said that there is a difference between those who call to their innovation and those who do not call to their innovation. And we do not hold the view that every person of innovation, by way of being an innovator, he's calling to his innovation. And that the statement of the scholars of the past who say that there are individuals who are considered callers to innovation and those who are not callers to innovation that this statement is batil, we do not accept this. Rather, that is ta'an in the position of the ulama of the past. And indeed, they are more knowledgeable of the affairs we have inherited from them. If the individual is known to be a person who hourly calls to the innovation or from the heads of innovation then it is a must that this individual be reprimanded and from the ways that the person is reprimanded that the person is not visited while he is sick until he repents so we have from amongst the Salaf, those who used to prevent visiting the people who hourly displayed and called to their innovation and the people who hourly were upon sin and transgression. Unless there is going to be a religious benefit in visiting them. The last matter of the Hadith is the statement of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa mata fatba'ahum and that when he dies follow his funeral procession meaning follow the janazah of the one who has died pray over the individual and witness his burial this is from the rights of the Muslim over the Muslim and the one who prays over the deceased then they get a reward of a qirat And the one who prays over the deceased as well as witnesses the burial, they get qiratan. And the qirat is like the size of a magnificent mountain. As come in the narration of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, Man shahid al-janazata hatta yusalla alayha falahu qirat. 
ومن شهدها حتى تدفن فله قيراطان قيل وما القيراطان قال مثل الجبلين العظيمين أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet mentioned that whoever witnesses the janaza until the individual is prayed over, he gets the reward of a qirat. And whoever witnesses the burial of the janaza, then for him is two qirat. So it was said, what is the two qirat? He said, the likes of two magnificent mountains. Salat al janaza is fardun kifaya. It is a communal obligation. As for following the deceased to the burial ground, then this is re recommended. And indeed, when we pray over our dead and make dua for our dead, this is from the rites mm -hmm. after the Muslim has died. And this shows that the Muslim is honored, alive, or dead. From the general ruling that the Muslim is honored, alive, or dead. Showing the sacredness of the Muslim. And the honor and the status of the Muslim. The issue comes, what about the woman praying the Janazah prayer? Is this something that is legislated for the woman to pray the Janazah prayer? The ulama have mentioned that it is permissible for the woman to pray the Janaza prayer based upon the texts that have come regarding this matter. From the texts We have that Aisha radiallahu anha, she commanded that the body of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas be brought into the masjid and then she prayed over him. So some people criticize that. And then she mentioned Ma Asra. مَا نَسِيَ النَّاسِ مَا صَلَّى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ عَلَى سُحِيرِ بْنُ الْبَيْضَى إِلَّا فِي الْمَسْجِدِ She said, how quick the people have forgot. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم did not pray over Suhair ibn al-Baydha except that he prayed over him in the masjid. So Aisha رضي الله عنها she prayed over Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas in the masjid. And none of the companions came and opposed Aisha radiallahu anha for praying over Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Also, it has been mentioned by Alejda to Daima, the permanent committee of scholars, that the origin in relation to the affairs of worship, which Allah has legislated in his book, or his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has legislated in the sunnah, that they are general for the men as well as the women. 
until there comes an evidence that shows that a matter is specifically for the men excluding the woman or specifically for the woman excluding the men. So the Salat al-Janazah is from the acts of worship that have been legislated by Allah Ta'ala as well as His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the address is general to the men as well as the women, except that in most cases it is the men who pray over the, the deceased due to the women in most cases being in their homes. And the, state, the scholars went on to mention that if it came to a situation where no one from amongst the men prayed over the deceased and, and there were only women to pray over the deceased, then the obligation of praying over the deceased has been fulfilled. And they mention the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha that she prayed over Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas radiallahu anhu. And it is not known that any of the Sahaba criticized her for praying over Sa'd ibn Abi Waqas. So this is an indication that the woman, they share in the affair of the Janazah prayer. Or it may be a case that only women can pray over the deceased. And when they do attend the janazah prayer, their ranks are to be behind the ranks of the men, as in the normal prayer. And they do not mix in the ranks with the men. And then the legend of the Daima, they mention that the woman should not go to the graveyards to visit for the burial. In this matter, the scholars have differed over. A question was posed to the Imam, one of the Imma of Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah in our time, Al Imam Muqbil ibn Hadi al Wadi'i. Rahimahullah Ta'ala, the Imam of Yemen. He was asked, what is the correct statement regarding the woman going to the graves? And what is the difference between the statement Azawarat and Azairat? And Imam Muqbil rahimahullah ta'ala, he stated, he said the correct ruling or the correct statement regarding this matter is the permissibility of the woman visiting the graves. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned in the narration, Kuntu nahaytukum an ziyarat al-kubur fuzuruha. The Prophet Sallallahu said, I prohibited you from visiting the graves, so visit the graves now. And then also in, in the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha, which she stated to the Prophet Sallallahu she said, Ara'ayta ya Rasulallah in kharajtu ila al-maqbara, madha aqul? She said, O Messenger of Allah, what should I say if I was to go to the graves? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Quli as-salam alaykum dar qawm mu'mineen. He taught her to say, May the peace be upon the believing people of this abode. Or the abode of the, be the believing people. So the Prophet, the Shaykh went on to mention, Rahimahullah, Allamaha. Dua al ziyara that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught Aisha the dua to make when visiting the graves. So now, if it was prohibited for a woman to visit the grave, then he would have told Aisha, Oh Aisha, it is not for you to visit the graves. 
Also, Aisha radiallahu anha, as the Sheikh, he continues, Zarat qabr akhiha Abdul Rahman. The Aisha radiallahu anha, she visited the grave of her brother Abdul Rahman. The Sheikh says, Fal asl huwa umum at tashri'ah. He says, so the origin is the generality of the legislation for everyone, meaning men and women. That's the origin. And then he mentioned, Rahimahullah, as for the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu mentioned, la'an Allah, zawarat al kubur that the curse of Allah is upon the zawarat al kubur that the curse of Allah is upon the women who are zawarat, meaning the women who frequently visit the graves. Shik Muqbil rahimahullah, he said, for yuhtamal annahu qabl al ijaba. He said, this is possible that this was before the obligation to keep away from the visiting of the graves. Based upon the statement of the Prophet, I used to prohibit you from visiting the graves, so visit them now. Or it is possible that what is meant by these women who visit these graves, the woman who may say statements that entail that which will end, or indulging in something from that which is disobedience of Allah, which takes place in these visits to the grave, or like the visiting of the grave of al Hussein or al Badawi, and the men and the women intermingling amongst one another when visiting the graves, or the visiting of the grave of Ibn Ulwan, or some of the graves that are in Tihama, and the men and the women, they mix together, and it's possible that some indecency can take place from the men and the women mixing together when visiting the graves. Also, it is stated The Prophet Sallallahu when he passed by the grave and he seen the woman crying over the grave. And the Prophet Sallallahu he had advised her to fear Allah and to be patient. He said, Fear Allah and be patient. And she stated, Ilayka anni, get away from me. فَإِنَّكَ لَمْ تُصَبْ بِمُصِيبَتِي وَلَمْ تَعْرِفُ She said, go away from me, for you haven't been afflicted with my calamity. So then it was said to her that that was the messenger of Allah you were speaking to. She didn't know. So then she came to the home of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she did not find any doorman there. And she said, Lem I didn't know it was you. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in, in, in ula, That indeed, true patience is at the first stroke of the calamity. al hafid he stated that some of the scholars, they use this narration as a proof for the permissibility of visiting the graves, whether the grave is a man or a woman. So the meaning of the Zawarat, it will be the woman who frequently visit the graves. So if the woman, they visit the graves, they are not to visit the graves in abundance, consistently, meaning from time to time, they go to the graves. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a'lam. And this is what I have to present, whatever is correct. The praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever is incorrect, it is from myself.